Good evening, I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, on the first day of a Middle East ceasefire, our team reports from Gaza. We are at a checkpoint, the first checkpoint of two to get into Gaza. Their first-hand look after 11 days of war. Also tonight, if you're ready for the long weekend, listen first to the pleas for caution. Stay local, stay close to home. Opening up, two popular public figures discuss long-held private pain. I was willing to take drugs. I was willing to try and do the things that made me feel less like I was feeling. And we're talking to kids about getting vaccinated. We're getting closer to the end with every vaccine, every dose delivered to different people. They've got a lot to say. This is The National. After 11 days of war, there's now been more than 24 hours of relative calm in the Middle East. But in both Israel and the Palestinian territories, the ceasefire is fragile and already under pressure. Citing massive blows to Hamas, the Israeli Prime Minister claimed victory. But some critics in Israel portray the ceasefire as surrender to the militant group. And Hamas is treating this as its victory. Meanwhile, there was violence in the West Bank and at the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound in Jerusalem. That site and the issues around access to it, one of the triggers of the latest fighting. But it is the Gaza Strip that bore the brunt. Margaret Evans is there and shows us how the rockets and airstrikes may have gone quiet, but the sounds of fear and anguish still echo. Something Gaza City hasn't seen in nearly two weeks. Calm in the skies above it. Nothing to fear from the heavens, at least for now. And on the ground, people daring to breathe again, to step outside and smile after 11 days of a brutal bombardment. But mixed in with the scenes of pure relief were those of grief. Funeral tents set up next to buildings reduced to rubble by the Israeli airstrikes. So sustained was the Israeli campaign that some in Gaza are only now mourning their dead in public. Here, six members of the same family are being remembered. Ahmed Abu Asi was friends with one of them, a fellow student. There was no reason for the Israelis to bomb this house, he says. Was it the right thing to do for Hamas to fire the rockets at Jerusalem? Was it worth it? The resistance bombed Israel, he says. My friend isn't coming back. At least three buildings on the same street were hit, and people have come to see the damage for themselves. This was also the first day since the start of the conflict that Israel allowed journalists to enter Gaza. So we've actually just crossed over from Israel into the Gaza Strip. Um, that's Israel behind me. We are at a checkpoint, the first checkpoint of two to get into Gaza. The first is run by Fatah, which is reflective of the Palestinian Authority, which is in control in the West Bank. But we have to get through a second checkpoint, which is run by Hamas. That's the group that actually controls the Gaza Strip. The militant Islamist group has portrayed the ceasefire as a great victory, insisting Israel made concessions on events in occupied East Jerusalem. Israel has said the ceasefire was unconditional. In Han Yunus, several Hamas fighters killed when Israel targeted underground tunnels were buried. Before this latest conflict, public approval for Hamas was dropping, a struggling economy declining even further on their watch. It's too early to tell whether the events of recent days will change that, but people are tired. Amal al-Masri's daughter had open-heart surgery just before the fighting began. <laughs> We are tired of wars, she says. The last one was very hard on me. We're exhausted and we want peace. And a future for their children, one where they can actually be children and live safe from harm. Margaret Evans, CBC News, Gaza. Well, now to COVID-19 in Canada's worst hit province. Manitoba's premier got reassurances today that the federal government will send help. But as Bartley Kivas shows us,
The premier was still criticized at home for taking so long to ask. With more COVID patients in hospitals and near record numbers in ICUs, the warnings from healthcare officials are dire. Our health system is, is on the brink of being overwhelmed. Today, Premier Brian Pallister directly asked the Prime Minister to take the pressure off by sending in 50 nurses, 20 respiratory therapists and 50 contact tracers. Manitoba doctors say it's about time. You know, at the end of the day, um, when we're in a crisis, asking for help is, is not a sign of weakness, it's a sign of strength. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm comforted to know that uh, help has been sought um, from other provinces but it should have been done sooner. It's a point the mayor of Winnipeg made publicly today. I'm disappointed that once again in the third wave, we're in a position where the provincial government is reacting to higher case counts instead of taking the proactive measures weeks ago that I and others, including doctors, had been calling for. The federal government promised Manitoba a swift response. I know the public health agency is looking right now across the government of Canada up as to how quickly we can bring together these personnel. It's unclear where the personnel would come from. The Canadian Armed Forces are one option. The Union for Respiratory Therapists questions if there are any to spare. Are we in a situation now where we're making announcements and, and making uh, announcements like this uh, to make it appear that we're finally doing something? The situation is urgent. The province has transferred more stable ICU patients to Ontario and may send even more to Saskatchewan and North Dakota. Premier Brian Pallister described this week as the darkest days of the pandemic, but they may still be coming. Provincial modelling projects the number of COVID patients in Manitoba ICUs could continue to rise into June. Bart Kivas, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, as this Victoria Day long weekend beckons to Canadians, there was a chorus of pleading today from across the country to keep our COVID guard up. Our actions this long weekend could not be more important. COVID-19 resurgences have followed social gatherings during past holidays and long weekends. Pretty common to think of the May long weekend as the unofficial start to Canada's summer. But there is this undeniable tension between the usual urge to get together with friends and the need to limit the spread of the virus. Greg Rasmussen shows us what that looks like. It's off to the family cabin. We've just kind of been like at our house a lot because our school just got shut down. Travel that's allowed in BC because it's inside a restricted zone. Even so, their plans are low key. We keep to ourselves. It'll probably include a little bit of reading and uh, possibly some walking on the beach and uh, we may go for a boat ride. At the ferry terminal, passenger traffic is down 60% from normal. How's this family doing? The manager at this restaurant next to the terminal has a message for those she sees making non-essential trips. You need to stay where you are for a little bit longer so we can get out of this. Infection rates are falling in most of the country and vaccines ramping up. But many say the long weekend's not the time to bend the rules. I know people would like to have a holiday away from restrictions. That time will come soon, but it is not this long weekend. So stay local, stay close to home. You know, I've been calling for some time for doubling, if not tripling, of the penalties and the fines for first-time offences. We are asking Albertans to please postpone their travel to Banff for just a little while longer. We want to ensure everyone's safety. We, we're not trying to sound like, you know, the Debbie Downers of the summer. The bison are a big draw at this national park, sometimes creating long lineups of visitors. People are craving this. People need something to do. People need things to be open again. The park gates will be open, but officials are asking people to stay away. We're asking visitors to consider visiting on weekdays because that's when it's really quiet and you're going to get the picturesque experience you're looking for. Back in Horseshoe Bay, some are counting the days. Two be celibate for Mike. Next year at this time, I'll be, let's open the doors, let's make it happen, let's go, let's make up for everything that we lost. But for now, the message remains, keep in your bubble and don't stray too far from home. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. Ontario is resuming the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine, but only as a second dose. This is a very good vaccine that has provided tremendous uh, uh, impact in the UK and other countries. 
The province stopped giving the shot about 10 days ago over concerns about very rare blood clots, but it now says new data suggests the benefits far outweigh the risk with second doses. Ontario has tens of thousands of shots set to expire at the end of the month. Now, some experts are asking the question whether everyone really needs a second shot, particularly those who've already been infected once before. Christine Birak explains. Well over a million Canadians have been infected. Many of them, like Lori Henley, now have some protection or natural immunity against this virus. I was told by public health when I tested positive that I would have some immunity. I couldn't say how much. The World Health Organization now says while it varies by age and severity of symptoms, most people who have been infected are protected against reinfection for at least six to eight months. And that natural infection may provide similar protection as vaccination. I personally think that people that have natural immunity, a good level of natural immunity, I, I don't understand why they would receive two doses of vaccine. A Canadian panel of experts currently recommends those who've had COVID-19 still receive two shots, but Quebec is offering one. The province is now tracking those who've been infected and received a single shot as adequately vaccinated. Some scientists agree. Uh, it's another population that, uh, you know, we should document. It's another population that should also uh, be considered as protected. Counting those who have natural immunity along with people who are fully protected could help countries reach overall protection. While vaccines show our immune system a small piece of the invading virus, natural infection allows our body to see the whole virus, which can build broader defenses. As for which protection lasts longer? This is very much an active area of research trying to tease out which of those immune responses are the most important in terms of providing long-lasting, durable, and robust immune protection. But if those who've been infected are well protected, there is an added benefit. It would be incredibly helpful. It means that vaccines are going to be more available for people globally. After having COVID and a shot of vaccine, Henley's open to dropping her second dose. Uh, it, it should go to someone more vulnerable. I, I agree. Adding, if health advice changes, she'll follow it. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. Now let's bring in Dr. Alex Wong, an infectious diseases specialist in Regina, because uh, Dr. Wong, I, I want to get at this question of overall protection. So we're, we're talking about those with immunity through infection, and we have more than you know 1.3 million confirmed cases in Canada. <laughs> so how close is that to the actual number of Canadians we believe may have been infected? So Andrew, we know that there are patients who have been infected who have not been reported or diagnosed. So, you know, there's a proportion of people who get infected with COVID-19 who are asymptomatic. And then there's some people that just don't go and get tested, right? So in uh, the United States, the CDC is estimating that it's about one in four people uh, who have gotten infected who have uh, actually been reported. Mm. So if we kind of look at that number, sort of one in two, one in three here in Canada, probably about seven to 10 percent of the entire Canadian population has at some point in time had COVID-19 thus far. And so if we add that to the knowledge that, you know, we know about half of Canadians have been vaccinated, are we getting closer to this idea of herd immunity? We're getting closer. Uh, I think a lot of the experts at this point still believe that the idea of herd immunity where the virus is going to be completely gone forever is probably not something that's going to be realistic or achievable. But the fact that we're vaccinating as quickly as possible, and then when you add this additional sort of 7 to 10 percent of people who have some degree of natural protection because they've recovered from infection, you know, we're definitely getting closer, but we need to keep vaccinating as fast as possible. Okay. Dr. Wong, thank you. Thanks. Now, with children as young as 12 now eligible to get the vaccine, kids and their parents are facing a big decision. And as they weigh whether to get the shot, health experts are trying to ensure those decisions are informed. Bonnie Allen shows us how. Now that anyone 12 and up can get a vaccine in Saskatchewan, Angela True lined up early to get her kids the shot. I think it's a huge responsibility to parents to vaccinate your kids to keep your kids safe. And her 16-year-old son had no concerns about the vaccine. No, none at all. 
but that's not the case for all kids. My class and I would like to know what are the side effects of the Pfizer vaccine on teens and should we be worried about getting it? Well, another great question. Clinical microbiology specialist Dr. Joseph Blondo agreed to take questions from a dozen Saskatchewan schools. What is inside the vaccine and how does it work? He says kids need trustworthy information to decide for themselves that the vaccine is safe and necessary. We're all part of the solution. Saskatchewan health officials are seeking parental permission for vaccines in schools, but generally teenagers can choose or refuse the vaccine. Heather Flynn is a registered nurse whose 17-year-old son is hesitant to get the shot. It has been difficult, and boy, did I just want to grab him and take him to a vaccine clinic and just sit on them, sure. But can I do that? No. <laughs> so she arranged for her son to speak to a pediatrician. We want to teach him to make informed, educated choices for his life. Some Alberta doctors are now offering free virtual consultations to parents and kids. People who come to us are not the staunch anti-vaxxer or anti-vaccine um, activists. These are people truly trying to make a, a really informed and good decision. Dr. Alex Wong has also answered questions from hundreds of school children. It's you know important for us to acknowledge that kids are smart. Beyond explaining the science, experts say young people also respond to messages that encourage them to do their part to help others and to regain their freedom. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. And we are going to hear directly from two kids who just got vaccinated and they've got lots to say about what they've been through and what the vaccine represents to them. Uh, that's coming up in about 15 minutes. Well, today, Canada did extend its ban on flights from India and Pakistan for another month. And I can say that we have seen a significant reduction in the number of positive cases of COVID-19 arriving from international flights since the res this restriction was put in place. Also, travellers who take an indirect route to Canada from either India or Pakistan are required to test negative for COVID-19 in a third country before boarding their final flight. Well, more than 500 WestJet employees from two cities have joined Canada's largest private sector union. Workers today more than ever realize that they need a legal binding contract. The union blasted WestJet's parent company for outsourcing thousands of jobs and says it will fight to bring back workers laid off during the pandemic. The newly unionized employees are airport workers like baggage handlers, customer service reps in Vancouver and in Calgary. Well, there will be a good number of Canadians turning to their ATVs, perhaps, this long weekend. But we are learning more about just how dangerous they can be if you're inexperienced or make a wrong decision at the wrong time. Carissa Donkton brings us the CBC News investigation showing a lack of regulations and how the parents of a nine-year-old boy want that to change. Hold that. Keep it closed. Horatio McLeod was a smart nine-year-old boy who loved magic and outer space. Wow. almost as much as he loved his two little sisters. But on September 9, 2017, Horatio went on a play date and never came home. He was a passenger in a youth-sized side-by-side driven by a 10-year-old friend. No license was required to drive it. And Horatio wasn't wearing the seatbelt when the all-train vehicle careened into a culvert. His parents, Chris and Meredith, are turning their grief into action seeking improved safety for off-road riders. We're forever changed. That's what's at stake. If people, if the awareness isn't there before you, you know, turn on the engine. There are memorials to Horatio around their home, but they say the best way to honor his life would be to prevent more deaths. No national agency publishes up-to-date records of off-road deaths, but CBC News has dug through local reports and found that at least 555 Canadians have died on ATVs or snowmobiles since 2018. A coroner's inquest into Horatio's death was held last fall. 27 recommendations were made, including better tracking of injuries and deaths, mandatory driver's training, and a ban on selling youth-sized machines until they're proven safe. The Canadian Quad Council represents rider federations across Canada. It too wants to see stronger rules for off-roading. They don't let you drive anything else with an engine on it or a motor on it without getting training. Why are ATVs exempt? 
Neither the federal government nor Ontario has committed to change yet. The McLeods say they won't give up until they see new regulations, something they hope will be called Horatio's Law. Carissa Donkin, CBC News, Fredericton. Well, tonight, two very candid conversations about trauma and mental health from two very big names. A producer said to me, take your clothes off. And I said no. Next on The National, Lady Gaga and Prince Harry open up about the pain in their pasts in hopes of a better conversation in the future. I was willing to take drugs. I was willing to try and do the things that made me feel less like I was feeling. Plus, the race to save a piece of Canada's disappearing East Coast. A lot of land lost, and uh, it's never coming back. And the good Samaritan who saved a woman being attacked on a subway platform. It's unmistakable. That's a stabbing happening. And she screamed, and I ran toward it. We're back in two. Welcome back. Today, Prince Harry and Oprah Winfrey launched their new Apple TV series on mental health. And both Harry and pop superstar Lady Gaga appeared in the first episode, sharing how past trauma never really went away. For Harry, it was the death of his mother, Princess Diana. For Lady Gaga, it was having been raped at age 19. Now, she's talked about that publicly before, but as you will hear, not in such detail. I was 19 years old. And a producer said to me, take your clothes off. And I said, no. They didn't stop asking me. And then I just froze and I just, I don't, re I don't even remember. <laughs> I do not ever want to face that person again. Like so many other assault victims, she spoke of re-experiencing trauma and confusion long after her attack. Years later, I went to the hospital. They brought a psychiatrist in. I said, why is there a psych here? I can't feel my body. First, I felt full-on pain. Then I went numb. And I realized that it was the same pain that I felt when the person who raped me dropped me off pregnant on a corner. When it comes to publicly sharing stories like this, psychiatrist Dr. Shimmy Kang sees real benefits for others, especially younger survivors. I've worked with a lot of young people, young adults and teenagers, and when celebrities speak out, there really is a, a sense that they are not alone. Um, this story is not just theirs. You can come back from things like that, but when it, when it hits you really hard, it can, it can, it can change you. Lady Gaga says she has successfully learned to live with her assault, but at a cost. For a couple years, I was not the same girl. Now, Prince Harry says discussing the loss of his mother has become a form of therapy. But in his conversation with Oprah, as that has come out, just as a dark part of Diana's story has reemerged, a judgment that she was manipulated into her famous BBC interview. Renee Filipponi has the latest. For me, the thing I remember the most was the sound of the horse's hooves going along the, along the mall, the red brick road. <laughs> uh -huh. Prince Harry says the pain of this moment in grieving his mother in this way has haunted him ever since. He opened up yet again about his struggles in a new TV series produced with Oprah Winfrey about mental health. I was willing to take drugs. I was willing to try and do the things that made me feel less like I was feeling. Decades after her death, Princess Diana's tragic story not only has a lasting impact on her sons, but continues to make headlines. Backlash against the BBC is growing over a report on how it used manipulation and lies to land this 1995 interview, where Princess Diana opened up about her failing marriage and admitted she had an affair. Prime Minister Boris Johnson says the details are concerning. I can only imagine the feelings of the, of the royal family, and uh, I hope very much that the BBC will be taking every possible step to make sure that nothing like this ever happens again. The inquiry found reporter Martin Bashir faked documents to suggest Princess Diana was being spied on in order to gain her trust. 
It brings indescribable sadness to The revelations invoked the this rare emotional response from Prince William uh, yesterday, who says the BBC failed his mother. Concerns were raised not long after the interview, and today a whistleblower is speaking out. And was told within 25 hours of doing that that effectively I would no longer be part of the programme. I had been disloyal. Uh, that's what happened to whistleblowers at that time at the BBC. In response, there are calls to review the governance structure of the BBC, and the Metropolitan Police are looking to see if there is enough evidence to support a criminal investigation. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, next, a conversation with two young Canadians who just got their COVID vaccines. I'm very excited for the pandemic to go away completely. We'll talk about why it was so important to them, the moment it happened, and what feels different now. And later, the man who jumped in to save a woman on a New York subway platform. I happened to be looking in the right direction. I saw her get yanked back violently from the edge of the platform. And that Good Samaritan just happens to work with the National. We'll talk to him in just a moment. Well, for months now, generation after generation has lined up to get their shot. The eligible age going down as supply has gone up. But most recently, Health Canada authorized the Pfizer-BioNTech shot for anyone 12 and up, a move the National Advisory Council on Immunization supported this week. Massey recommends that a complete series of two doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech COVID-19 vaccine can be offered to individuals 12 to 18 years of age. Since then, just look at the lines. They're starting to look a little different, huh? As younger and younger Canadians are able to book their appointments and get their shot at returning to some kind of normal. So let's hear from two young Canadians who both got vaccinated this week. Simran Jacob is 14. She joins us from Toronto. And Sylvia Leon Ray is 11, turning 12 in July. So she was able to get the shot as well. She's in Edmonton. Hello. Uh, thank you both for joining me. Thanks. Okay, so so we're gonna start real simple. Just just like one word, uh, Simran. If you, if you could choose one word to describe how you have felt during this pandemic, what would it be? Stressed. Stressed. Okay, yeah, I can I can uh, relate to that. Sylvia, one word. Lonely. Lonely. Okay, let's let's use a few more words. Uh, Sylvia, why lonely? Well, lonely because the only time I could see my friends, well, see my friends was like texting and, you know, like Google Meets during this pandemic. And even once we came back to school, like face to face, we had to wear our masks and we had to social distance. Yeah, and, and you just always have to, yeah, maintain that space. And you, you don't really feel like you're, you're hanging out with your friends, even when you're hanging out with your friends. I, I totally get that. Simran, uh, you said stressed. What, what stresses out a 14-year-old? I feel like the pandemic has really taken a toll on everybody's mental health. But not only that, I am in grade 8, and I'm going to high school next year. So online school plus preparations for high school, it gets pretty stressful um, a lot of the time. So Simran, how, how badly did you want to get the shot? I wanted to get it pretty badly. I'm very excited for the pandemic to go away completely. We've been doing this for over a year. We've been in lockdown for over a year. It's after that amount of time, something like this, it, you get tired of it very easily. So when I'm hoping that everything goes back to normal and now that people, younger people are able to get the shots, there is more of a chance of that happening um, sooner rather than later. Sylvia, I, I, I'm curious to hear from you how your friends and you feel about getting the shot. I mean, is anyone nervous about getting the shot? Um, I think everybody's at least a little nervous when like walking up to the line, um, to like the little cubicle and getting the sh shot from the nurse. And well, I am pretty happy that I got the vaccine and I've been waiting to get it like 
as soon as the news broke out that I could get it. And um, I think my friends feel the same way. And tell me, Sylvia, what that moment was like. I mean, I, you know, I know no one likes needles and it, and it always hurts a little bit when it goes in, but I don't know, what was going through your head when you were getting that shot and maybe a little bit after you got the shot? Um, so, like, the nurse first, like, asked me about school and I said, like, so I started explaining to her and then I just felt like a sharp pain. She, like, distracted me before <laughs> getting the needle. I'm not great with needles, but I can pull through when the moment and, happens. And does it feel like there's kind of this weight lifted off your shoulder that, that you're getting, I don't know, kind of like one step closer to, to getting back to normal? Yes, definitely. Because what's the thing you're looking most forward to? I'm looking forward to being able to hug all my friends again, to be able to go outside without being stricken with anxiety, like, and worrying if I'm going to get, like, the coronavirus and like if I'm going to get a variant and would I pass it on to my friends and family and those who I cl host, hold close to my heart. Simran, I, I have time for one more question for you. I'm curious, you, you know, once you get the vaccine, it's not like everything changes suddenly, right? You still have to physical distance, you still have to do all the public health measures. But you tell me, I mean, what what feels different now? What changes for you? Just um, knowing that there is a light at the end of the tunnel. We're getting closer to the end with every vaccine, every dose delivered to different people. And we're going to eventually get there. No matter how long it takes, I'm just very hopeful and very excited for that. Simran and Sylvia, uh, you guys are both so smart. Uh, so thoughtful, so kind uh, and generous for sharing your stories with us. Thank you so much for taking this time to talk with us. I really appreciate that. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations. <laughs> Cheers. Okay, uh, coming up next, a first-hand look at New Brunswick's disappearing shoreline. As extreme weather takes its toll, we are going to hear from people who are anxious for their homes and fighting to protect the coast. It's good to, to have that communication and see that he's uh, doing well and resting at home. Well, an update from the head coach of the Toronto Maple Leafs about the team's captain. A hit to the head during last night's game sent John Tavares to the hospital. The team says he has a concussion and will be out of the playoffs indefinitely. We're trying to remove those protesters that are in that area so that industry can go through and just following with this Supreme Court injunction. Some 30 people have now been arrested as RCMP, the RCMP removes protest blockades in forests on Vancouver Island. Protesters say they are fighting to save some of the region's last remaining old growth. Well, the region of New Brunswick is in a race against the effects of climate change. And it's got a small group of researchers trying to hold back the waves. The Acadian Peninsula sits in the northeast corner of the province. Several communities there are watching extreme weather tear away at their shorelines year by year, storm by storm. A CBC News team went for a first-hand look. Here we are in Saint Marie Saint Raphael, and we can see the erosion. And here we have several causes of the erosion. Uh, climate change, yes. Depending on the, the location, we talk about 80, 90 uh, meter you lose. Uh, on the website, we have um, uh, an illustration showing uh, between uh, 1944 to the year of 2000, how much you lose on the coast? But the uh, is not able to stay the two years for something six, the substance six. We mark up the four hundred feet there. How many? I don't know the four hundred feet here. Two hundred feet. Oh, two hundred feet. The twenty-first of January, two thousand and twenty-two, the fifty-second, sixty-first of January, two thousand and twenty-two, the seventy-second, seventy-first of January. Yes. But for arrested, arrested, my life. That affects that. 
Ça peut être pour deux trois ans, du coup. Ça peut pas mourir là. We cannot change what we do in the past. So, yes, we can work changing, changing the uh, carbon, etc. But in the present time, there are, we have impacts uh, related to the water, relating to the wind. You can find Mother Nature. What we can do, it is to understand what are the impacts of the climate change on the coast and how we can slow the impacts, how we can protect the coast. Right now we are on a new road, but uh, up to uh, five, six years ago, the road was uh, way closer to the sea. Now there's no road. <laughs> Actually, the sea uh, washed it out and uh, now it's just a beach. Well, there's some concerns about, among the local residents in chasson fils that if the dunes breaks apart because of the erosion, that it might uh, put their land in danger towards the erosion. Because uh, on one side of the dune, there's the St. Lawrence Gulf with uh, bigger waves and a lot of uh, erosion power, I can say. It's a disaster. <laughs> a lot of land lost and uh, it's never coming back. Uh, we got a breakwater done. If you want to stay on the shorelines, you've got to invest. So the village is mostly under the sea level and the dune it completely uh, protects the infrastructure there. Without the dune, the village will be flooded uh, every storm. Chaque tempête nous rend un peu nerveux. Euh, un exemple que je peux vous donner, euh, Dorian ici a duré de 6 à 8 heures. Si que ça aurait duré euh, 24 heures, euh, on aurait été euh, beaucoup plus, plus nerveux que ça. Là. We have more uh, strong storms, stronger storms, uh, more often, and that's the main reason we, we're losing all that sand. When we, we trapped a lot of sand in the cages and uh, we hope that the vegetation is going to come back and strengthen the, the dune. The rocks can, will not be the only one solution because with one storm, with one big storm, you can lose all the rocks you put. So with the vegetation, like we can see here, uh, we saw at Le Goulet, we stabilize the soil with the roofs. So it is a better solution, but it will not stop the impact of the climate change. It will not stop the impact of the waves, etc. But it will help. There's a factor becoming more popular, it's called eco-anxiety. And uh, you can really feel in the population around here, uh, their, their loss of uh, uh, personal terrain, uh, cost of insurance increases, uh, loss of cultural terrain, like there's a park, there's a church. I grew up around here, so it's a bit of personal uh, uh, on a personal level, I think we, we need to stop the water rising. We present the risk to the, to the village. Uh, they have to create a group of citizens working with us. So we talk about the risk, we talk about the scenarios, the solution, the possible solution, and the working group choose what they want to put forward, what they want to implement. And after that, we go uh, at the office to, to propose the adaptation plan regarding all the feedbacks of the citizens. And also, I, I like the Acadian Peninsula. It's a very beautiful place, and we want to preserve it. Well, next, a moment of suspicion and a life-saving split-second decision. Hear from the man himself who jumped in to save a woman's life on a New York subway platform and why he suspected something bad might happen just before it did.
Welcome back. So watch this surveillance video carefully. You might notice this man's hand concealing an object, possibly a knife. Moments later, he begins to viciously stab a woman until a very brave Samaritan appears out of nowhere to tackle him. It's only then that some other passengers move in to help restrain the attacker, but it was that split-second decision that stopped a potentially deadly assault. Now, that good Samaritan, by the way, just so happens to be Sean Conaboy, a camera operator who works for CBC. He was on that platform after finishing a 12-hour shift for us in Times Square. So let's get the story of that heroic act in a hectic moment straight from the source. Uh, Sean, hello to you. I, I guess I have two questions. One, how are you? Two, what the heck were you thinking? I'm well, Andrew. Thank you. And thank you for asking. Uh, I'm just uh, happy to be alive, and I'm even more fortunate that I was able to help somebody who was in severe distress and could have potentially lost her life as the result of a random act of violence. Well, you know, I ask both questions uh, in all seriousness uh, because, I, you know, I'm kind of curious to know, did, did you know something was off before it actually happened? I mean, walk me up to that moment. I did. I noticed an individual who had been casing other people on the platform who were oblivious to him, you know, lost in their cell phones and their devices. And uh, he and I made eye contact, and it was a very low level of aggression, but it was yet an, uh, something that made my alert level go up. And obviously, things immediately turned on a dime when that person started attacking a woman on the platform. Tell me about your decision to step in. I mean, th that, that's a hell of an instinct, right? It was the only thing to do. I had an unusual vantage point from where I was looking. I happened to be looking in the right direction. I saw her get yanked back violently from the edge of the platform. I saw a knife produced and swung in a, a circular arcing motion. Uh, it's unmistakable. That's a stabbing happening. And she screamed, and I ran toward it. And at that point, you must be, I mean, I'm sure you're just in sort of fight or flight mode. You chose fight, obviously, or maybe you didn't choose it. It just happened. I mean, you must have been worried for your own safety at that point. Not yet. Uh, my only concern at that moment was to uh, incapacitate the attacker, to stop that attack from going any further. Uh, it wasn't until later that I was more concerned uh, for my own safety. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at you. I, I can see that, that physically you're okay, but I want to start with that first question again. Are, are you okay? And, and also, have you had a chance to speak with the victim in that attack? Yeah, physically I'm fine. Um, uh, it's been an emotional drain, but I was very grateful to, in fact, get a chance to speak to the victim this morning. She called me, a local reporter here in New York, put us in touch, and that's a great relief to hear her voice. And she sounds well. She's traumatized of course, but uh, she's going to make a full recovery. And uh, we plan to meet sometime next week at the grand jury testimony in the, uh, in the uh, Supreme Court. Sean, hell of a thing you did, uh, but I'm sure she's glad you did it. Uh, thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Andrew, I would do it again if I had to. Okay, a grade three student in Labrador is celebrating tonight. Pretty cool win. Uh, if you've never heard of the Braille Challenge, you are definitely going to want to stick around. It is our moment. Next. Jonathan Nakasak, a grade three student from Labrador, just won a Braille competition in his age category. He's the only visually impaired student at his school, and he was up against students from across Atlantic Canada. His win and his excitement is our moment. Miss Hillings, what? I actually won the Braille Challenge. You what? Did you come first place in your category? Yes. What? Congratulations. They told me I won first place and I get a talking watch. I jumped right to the scene. They said, oh, congratulations. I let them in the whole school. They cheered and and guess how loud they clapped? They sounded like. Jonathan took the braille really, really quickly. Uh, he remembers really well. So 
is almost like, as I would describe who, as some people, he has like a photographic memory. The Braille challenge, I read the email to him and I told him what it was about and how he read something in proofread and spelling and stuff. And I asked him if he wanted to try it for fun, not expecting to uh, have the result that we had. <laughs> oh man, Jonathan, that is super, I, 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 I gotta add to the applause. That, that's so wonderful. Congratulations on that. Now, for those of you who don't know, the Braille Challenge, it's all about, um, you know, reading and understanding and transcribing Braille, but doing it, you know, quickly uh, and accurately. Jonathan says he wants to re-enter again next year. I have no doubt he'll do super well. That's the National for this May 21st. Have a great night. <laughs>